thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am grateful to you and to Mr Speaker for granting this adjournment debate this evening on the issue of rural policing and hair coursing. Now, I believe it's particularly important that we discuss this issue now as what we must reflect upon and learn lessons from the most recent hair coursing season, which is coming to a close. Hair coursing, poaching, and the surrounding issues of antisocial behaviour should be matters of great concern for this House, both as individual crimes but also as examples of the challenges associated with policing our rural communities. And I've been struck by the number of honourable uh, members who have approached me uh, following notification that this debate would occur this evening. And in particular, I would like to uh, draw the attention of the House to the, the member for Louth and Horncastle, who will be unable to contribute, but I understand has a strong interest in some of the issues I'm about to raise. For me, there are two key issues which we must carefully consider. Firstly, we need to recognise the damage sustained by farmers, both to their properties and their well-being, as many are made to feel intimidated by those carrying out these heinous acts. And second, we need to carefully consider the police's approach to this problem and what tools are necessary to ensure the law is effectively enforced. I'd be delighted to give way. Way. I think he's absolutely right on both his points, but on the first point, farmers can of course dig ditches and, and barricade their fences, but many of them in my own constituency are afraid to do that in case they get retaliation against their own equipment as a result of doing, uh, undertaking that work. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, and as somebody who used to live in his constituency, I, I empathise strongly with the concerns he's raised, and I will come on to set out some similar examples of my constituents who've shared that same experience. My first and principal concern is the threat hair coursing poses to farming communities. Hair coursers are not simply a few individuals quietly chasing hares on unused land. Most often they are large groups who show serious contempt for the law and this results in a number of significant problems for my constituents. Farms are vandalised, people are intimidated and often these farmers are isolated and unable to count on the law to protect them in a timely way that, that they require. The National Farmers Union found that hair coursing is now the most common crime experienced by farmers in Wiltshire and has a number of troubling implications for rural communities. I'd be delighted to give them. Can my honourable friend agree with me that these uh, hair coursers who are marauding in their vehicles across farmers' land are not merely causing an unsightly mess but actually vandalising their livelihoods and should be dealt with accordingly? I'm very grateful for that intervention. I absolutely uh, agree with my honourable friend and I again will come on and set out some more examples and some suggestions for the Minister about what I think um, uh, could be done to deal with this problem. And I want to outline some of the implications of hair coursing now. First, when entering the private lands, hair coursers and poachers regularly cause criminal damage to gates, to hedgerows, fences and growing crops. This creates financial costs both for repairs to the damage and the need to increase security infrastructure, probably CCTVs. It also wastes a huge number of man hours as farmers are forced to look for damage and repair them. This is time consuming, frustrating and upsetting for many farmers whose land is their single most important asset for their business and their livelihoods. I want to raise the case of my constituent, Chris Swanton, who I think has farmed, his family have farmed on his farm for, for several generations. He has regularly experienced firsthand on his farm in South Wiltshire the problems I've described. And he wrote to me saying, I get upset because I'm very passionate about my farm and have a certain amount of pride in the appearance of my fields and crops. I find it gutting and very depressing to drive around my farm after hair courses have been all across my fields. Having worked 80 hours a week preparing seed beds and planting crops, 
It is totally unacceptable for farmers like Chris to find them ruined by mindless vandals. His experiences are by no means unique, as this happens right across my constituency and from what colleagues have been telling me in the last few days uh, over large tracts of rural England. But the impact for victims is not merely economic. Many face unjustifiable intimidation and antisocial behaviour on their doorsteps. Hair courses will often threaten and behave violently towards landowners who attempt to challenge them or collect evidence to report to the police. I'd be delighted to give way to my neighbour. <laughs> it's a great pleasure uh, to, to be able to contribute briefly and to congratulate my honourable friend and um, neighbour for bringing this to the House's attention. Does he agree with me that these are not good people, uh, that they probably contain within in them uh, individuals who are intent also on acquisitive crime. So not only are they violent people, but they are probably also eyeing up the property of our rural constituents, which he will know uh, very well, uh, is very much under threat at the moment, with bespoke criminality focused very much on thieving to order. And the suspicion is that that, that population and the hair coursing population are very often one and the same thing. Well, um, characteristically wise words from my um, neighbour and honourable friend, and I, I absolutely agree with him, and I think that this speaks to some of the suggestions that I will make later on about the nature of resourcing of rural policing, which I am delighted that the Minister is here to hear and hopefully respond positively to. I want to refer to Lincolnshire Police, who found that the majority of persons involved in hair coursing in their county already had those criminal histories that my honourable friend referred to and often travelled for hundreds of miles to participate. Now this is particularly distressing for farming communities who are genuinely vulnerable. The average age of farmers is now 59. They often work alone, meaning there are few or no witnesses to the crimes that are perpetrated on their land. And farmers know too well the repercussions of trying to deter courses from their own land from targeted break-ins and theft on their farms to extremes such as arson and direct physical attacks. Another one of my constituents, who understandably did not want to be named, lives on a farm with a teenage daughter, and whilst on their own land, the constituents were confronted by three men with dogs who threatened they would do over their car and carve up their crops. And my, my constituent's daughter now worries for her parents' safety, concerned that the courses know where they live and know what their car looks like. Now, this is completely unacceptable that constituents do not feel safe on their own land. And these are not isolated cases. In January this year, the BBC reported that violence and intimidation have escalated in the recent hair coursing season. And one farmer, who again wished not to be named, fearing for his own safety, stated they would kill us if they could. <coughs> so this evening I want to emphasise to the Minister, for rural communities and farmers in particular, hair coursing isn't simply a nuisance, it is a serious blight on livelihoods and well-being. And I want now though to turn to how we can ensure that there is an effective and coherent response to this issue by the police and the magistracy. And in preparing for this debate, I was struck by the exasperation of constituents who tell me they regularly reach out to the police but feel as if nothing is being done and that they are fighting hair courses on their own. And one constituent remarked that his tactic of digging ditches around the farm to stop the courses' vehicles felt almost medieval, building a moat to stop the enemy from entering. But at this point, I do want to pay tribute to Wiltshire Police, and I know that their officers do very difficult work in challenging circumstances and they should be commended for the innovative steps they are taking to improve their response to rural crime. The general quality of their work was acknowledged by the HMIC report last week, ranking them good across the board. I know that Wiltshire Police have put in place a number of initiatives including funding six dedicated wildlife crime officers and I welcome the news that further funding has been secured to train another five. But when it comes to police funding, 
I recognise the apparent logic of weighting funding by population size and demography, but ca cases such as hair coursing demonstrate that rural areas do require specialist resources to ensure that isolated and sparser populated communities do not feel abandoned by law enforcement. Will so, I'd be delighted to give way. I, I thank my honourable friend and congratulate him on uh, getting this adjournment debate. Um, my, the rural part of my constituency is actually served by Humberside Police, which is a predominantly uh, urban force, and the farming and rural community do feel somewhat neglected. Would you agree with me that it's equally important that wherever the rural community is situated, they receive uh, suitable priority from the police? I absolutely recognise the situation uh, he's uh, describing, which I think is particularly true for these hybrid constabularies that have to serve significant urban populations but nonetheless as he points out the the rural element needs to be properly recognized so with that in mind can I urge the minister to take these factors into consideration in his deliberations on the new policing funding format would he uh, note that Wiltshire though it's the 15th largest county geographically receives the fourth lowest budget from government the resources needed to tackle rural crime must be reflected in allocations within the overall funding envelope. And that will need him to challenge his officials on the different spreadsheets they're putting in front of him to make sure that the pockets of rural need are properly uh, reflected in the outcome of that uh, review. I'd be delighted to give one. Is, is the real challenge that rural police forces not face is that they deal with issues that, such as hair coursing that are a form of organised crime, as well as all of the challenges that also go with urban policing and changing for, uh, tactics such as cybercrime and domestic violence. So it is a perfect storm that requires special attention. I uh, absolutely agree with my honourable friend who, you know, once again comes up with a sensible analysis and, and, a, and a sense of how we need to join up better the different attempts to tackle this very difficult problem. I'll be delighted to give way. Isn't one of the issues the lack of neighbourhood policing in some of these rural areas? In the northern part of my constituency, uh, in Bassett Law, we have a police officer, Bill Bailey, who's a very long-standing officer who actually knows the lanes, he knows many of the criminals, he knows how to respond and to sort out these crimes. He's actually also fluent in the law in this area, but all too often when officers like Bill retire, as he is in October, they're replaced by police officers drawn from much wider areas. His replacement is likely to be drawn into urban areas like Worksop and Retford, where the crimes are very different, <coughs> response times will diminish, and it's very difficult for people, as the Honourable Member has already said, to be able to have certainty that police officers who understand the rurality of the area will be able to get out and sort out the problems. My Honourable Friend makes a, a reasonable point, and obviously, I think like many people on this side of the House, we have some familiarity with his constituency uh, in the weeks running up to his uh, election to this place. Um, but I wouldn't want to comment on the specific example. But I think the, the need to have the right resources in the right places is absolutely key. But if I may now return to the specific issue of hair coursing, I believe this is both a policing and a judicial issue. And I want to raise three policy concerns that I hope the Minister will reflect on to ensure that constituencies such as Salisbury and South Wiltshire can effectively deal with hair coursers and the many disruptions and problems that I just described. Firstly, I would ask that the Minister would consider creating a more widespread infrastructure for seizing and rehousing the dogs used in these criminal activities. Perhaps not personally, but would he look into how the police force organise themselves in this regard? Hair coursing dogs are high value assets worth tens of thousands of pounds. And the threat of dogs being taken or rehomed, therefore losing their value, will, I think, deter hair coursers. To be able to seize dogs, the police must have the appropriate kennels and facilities to look after them. And in Wiltshire, despite a large number of hair coursing incidents, we do not have this vital infrastructure in place. I'd be delighted to give one. With great interest to the honourable gentleman's remarks, uh, can you give us some idea 
of the extent of the hair coursing and illegal uh, badger baiting and illegal fox hunting that takes place and the percentage of those incidents that have been prosecuted in the recent past. Well, I'm, I'm grateful um, for, the, for the Honourable Member's uh, intervention. Actually, I can, but if you just wait a few minutes, I shall give him those, some, of those, some of those statistics. Um, so, in terms of legislation, hair coursing offences sometimes fall under the 1831 Game Act, and currently this Act does not provide the same powers of seizure and forfeiture of dogs and vehicles as the Hunting Act. Updating the 1831 Act could rectify this issue and allow for more hunting dogs to be seized. In addition, if we gave police the ability to recover kenneling costs for seized dogs in a similar way to seized vehicles, we could make this a more financially viable deterrent. Mm -hmm. The second issue I hope the Minister will consider is that of the penalties given to those guilty of poaching and hair coursing. Currently, the maximum possible penalty is unlimited. Despite this, the House of Commons Library reports that between 2010 and 2015, the average fine for offences under the Hunting Act was just £256.43. And Wiltshire Police told me that they had a recent case where three males were sent to court for offences under the Night Poaching Act. They had dogs, lamps and a gutting knife in their possession and had travelled some 100 miles from Wales to Wiltshire. The three men received a fine of just £50 each. These men were persistent offenders, known to the police. They were stopped again just three uh, days after their appearance in court. Are we honestly surprised that when hair courses have the opportunity to earn thousands of pounds betting on their illegal activities, these small fines do nothing to deter them? It is nothing short of outrageous that these individuals can simply give no comment at interview, go to court, plead guilty, accept a fine of £50-£100 and then return to the fields the very next day. Magistrates must be encouraged to use the full extent of penalties available to, to them. And as a former magistrate myself, I'm very aware of the guidance that sometimes uh, comes out and I, and I really feel it needs to be updated. Will the Minister commit to working with colleagues in the Ministry of Justice to examine these matters and ensure that sentencing guidance in this area is reviewed. The third and final issue is conviction rates. Uh, in Lincolnshire, the figures I do have available, between the six months between September 2015 and March 2016, there were 2,169 reported incidents of hair coursing. 176 men were charged or reported for summons but only 25 have actually been convicted. That is less than one in seven. And from the 176 charged individuals, 117 cases were discontinued, usually when witnesses declined to give statements for fear of reprisals. So even if CCTV cameras had been used, at farmers' expense presumably, farmers are obliged to declare they are the ones who individually put in the evidence capture system therefore putting their name on the record and risking retaliation from some of the acts that I described earlier. And this situation is simply blocking access to justice. Until the government send a clear message that farmers will be properly protected and perpetrators brought to justice, this unwillingness to provide evidence will only increase. So can I ask the Minister to work with local police forces and the CPS to ensure that farmers are not being deterred from coming forward because the evidence they are required to gather is too costly or cumbersome to obtain or puts them at risk. So in closing, hair coursing is a serious issue and we must not underestimate the financial and emotional harm it inflicts upon vulnerable rural communities and farmers in particular. Despite pockets of good practice, more must be done to stop the increasing prevalence across the country. I am concerned that the overall framework governing policing and sentencing does not currently act as a sufficient deterrent. So can I urge the Minister to look carefully at the measures I've suggested today. We must send a clear message to hair courses that they will, they will no longer be able to get off the hook with paltry sentences and very low conviction rates 
What they are doing is wrong, and we must not allow it to continue in the way that is currently being experienced. Sir Alan Hazelhurst. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, having the opportunity of an extended uh, debate is very handy and it shows that there are a number of colleagues who are concerned about this issue and I think the, my honourable friend, the, the member for Salisbury, has done us a service by finding an opportunity to, to raise this matter. Um, as I don't need reminding, I have been a uh, Member of Parliament for a very rural constituency for a long time. <laughs> I cannot recall uh, circumstances that I am now having reported to me on a, a regular basis ever having been raised with me before. Now, I, I'm not naive enough to believe that hair coursing has not been taking place in some of those former years, but it now seems to have achieved epidemic proportions uh, in, in my particular area. And it's village after village who is now beginning to report this issue. Um, now, the, the, the police are stretched, um, and whatever the force available <coughs> to the Chief Constable of Essex, or indeed it would apply with any other constabulary, is bound to be deployed uh, in areas of higher crime uh, than in areas of low crime. Uh, the district of Uttlesford uh, and rural Chelmsford are areas of, of low crime and it uh, doesn't mean to say that there isn't crime and that this particular form of crime which is now started to surge, if that isn't too uh, strong a word to describe what has been happening, is particularly difficult for the police to cope with. Uh, there is obviously great mobility on the part of the offenders and there needs to be cooperation I think between police forces in order to be able to uh, get a grip on this type of activity. My honourable friend, I'll give way to the honourable friend. I, I, thank, I thank my right honourable friend for, for giving way. I, in my own area the police have set up surveillance areas but it becomes a bit of a cat and mouse game because they're spotted setting up the surveillance areas and the hair courses simply move to another field in a, on another farm. Does he recognise that as a problem? Uh, ab absolutely, on the basis of the reports I'm getting from uh, constituents, I begin to ask myself, where next uh, is, is this going to occur? Um, Essex, uh, for historical reasons, has uh, uh, always felt underfunded. I think if any of my colleagues from Essex were uh, present for this debate tonight, they would heartily agree with that fact. We're always pressing for more resources. Uh, but this is now a new situation which we have to confront. Mm -hmm. I give way to my honourable friend. I thank him for giving way. The Chief Constable of Essex was recently quoted on Radio Lincolnshire complaining that Lincolnshire's success at dealing with hair coursing uh, meant that, in fact, uh, Essex was being placed under even greater strain. Uh, will he agree with me that actually what that underlines is that we have to work together to tackle this problem? I, I thank my honourable friend. I would absolutely agree with that. And I, hope that the Minister is able perhaps to respond uh, in the right terms to indicate that this has to be a coordinated uh, approach. Um, I just want to add <coughs> one thing uh, to the effect on people uh, of this activity. Uh, my honourable friend, the member for Salisbury, uh, spoke mainly about the farming community and that is absolutely right. But there have been some particularly odious practices performed in my constituency which affect not the farming community but people, ordinary residents in villages where mutilated corpses of hares are being laid on people's cars, on people's lawns and uh, parts of these dead bodies being draped round the handles of doors. Now this is absolutely sickening. Uh, and small children could, would obviously be more vulnerable to the horror of, of seeing that kind of thing. So this is getting beyond any thought that this is some uh, illegal sport that's going on uh, and it's far away from everybody and so on. Yes, it affects the farmers, as my honourable friend has very clearly uh, said, and I've had my farmers speak to me about this, but this extra dimension to it, I think, makes it truly appalling and underlines the need for some special attention to deal with this, because if this, this has not been as prevalent an activity in former years and is now a phenomenon to which we're all giving witness here today, then perhaps we have got to stamp down on it in order to quell it once and for all, and that does require special attention 
and special resources and special drive of policy. Simon Hall. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I <coughs> begin by echoing my both thanks and congratulations to my honourable friend uh, for Salisbury for raising this uh, important uh, issue. And whilst we might see this, and, um, or some people might see this debate and indeed this, this, this problem as merely a, 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 um, a, a, an issue of animal welfare and wildlife crime, uh, which of course it is. As others have alluded uh, to, it is much wider than that. You are talking about uh, vandalism uh, of property, uh, loss of income of farmer uh, and landowner, uh, theft of property, uh, intimidation of both farmers, their families, and in some instances their uh, gamekeepers and others employed on estates. There's also a lot of uh, road traffic issues as well, which do seem to be wrapped up into this. The driving of unlicensed vehicles, uninsured vehicles, driving whilst disqualified. All of this makes up that picture of criminality that my honourable friend, the member for South West Wiltshire, alluded to in his uh, intervention. Now, my constituency, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is, is easily split between uh, East and West. The western part of North Dorset is the Blackmore Vale, it is heavy clay, nobody would ever try to course on that, the, the, the hares don't like it, you can't make a form, it is too heavy. Sometimes even a 4x4 four four will get stuck in the clay of the Blackmore Vale. The Cranbourne Chase, however, on the eastern side of my constituency, beautiful undulating chalk down land, very similar to that uh, with its border in, in Wiltshire, is of course an ideal and fertile ground for illegal hair coursing, and it happens on all too regular a basis. And rather, as the point made by my honourable friend, the member for Boston, Anne Skegness, with the Chief Constable of um, uh, the Chief Constable of Essex blaming the robustness of his colleague in Lincolnshire for transporting a problem from effectively across a county border. We too in Dorset have had an element of that given the very significant success which the Chief Constable and officers of Wiltshire have had in clamping down in that county. They have merely translocated uh, over the border to us. And I agree entirely with what my honourable friend has said with regards to the value of the dog, of the sight hound used for this uh, purpose. And I was told by uh, one of my local police officers that when having confiscated a, a telephone from a hair courser, uh, they looked at their, uh, I'm not going to tell you why, but they looked at the, at the gentleman's uh, photo album on the phone. He had 184 photographs, Madam Deputy Speaker. 20 of his family and 164 of his dog, which I think illustrates the importance <laughs> and value that these people are placing on their livestock. But the problem is exactly as my honourable friend has suggested. Uh, local authorities have pulled away from effectively taking stray dogs off the street and have contracted it out on an often rather narrowly defined contract. The police don't have kennels. Uh, to house uh, these dogs, and I would like to see actually a far more robust approach, not just in the provisioning of kennels, but also the removal and conf permanent confiscation of dogs and their rehousing. Would my friend give way? Of course. I don't know if my own friend seen, but I think last year in Scotland saw the first time that uh, a hair courser or group of hair coursers were prosecuted successfully and actually imprisoned using DNA evidence taken from a confiscated dog. And so given the scale and importance of these crimes, as we've heard in the debate so far, actually that's something that the police elsewhere in the country should be looking to take forward. Well, I, I agree uh, very much with my honourable friend, and the deployment of technologies uh, which may have been advanced uh, for other purposes can easily be, uh, be used for exactly the sort of incident that my honourable friend for Newark has uh, suggested. But I want to draw the House's uh, attention, if I may, to actually I think what is the very excellent work which the Dorset Constabulary has undertaken uh, in this area. Uh, under the leadership of Martin Underhill, our Police and Crime uh, Commissioner and the Chief Constable, and having had discussions certainly with me uh, as a Member of Parliament, we now actually have a dedicated rural team not just in name only, but they have the right vehicles, they have 4x4s, they have Polaris's, they have the right sort of telephones and equipment, uh, etc., and they are doing a fantastic job. And it was my real pleasure, if that is the word, uh, to join them on a night operation ranging from 8 o'clock in the evening through to 2 o'clock in the morning, 
where a collaboration of three police forces, officers from Dorset, from Wiltshire and from Hampshire, uh, came together with local farmers and gamekeepers and me. I was obviously the heavy man brought in for the intimidation. Uh, in order to, and we drove around the country using intelligence, using telephones, making sure, identifying where people might be and disrupting activity as it was about to unfold. And this is a very good way, this sort of interception and interruption of illegal activity uh, taking place in our countryside. We've spoken, a number of uh, honourable friends have mentioned uh, intimidation. Um, and I just wondered, listening to those statistics uh, that my honourable friend uh, provided uh, the House with regards to the incidents of um, people being brought to court, and then actually the rather lenient slap on the wrist fines. You know, if you're prepared to wager ten thousand pounds on one hound, uh, one greyhound getting a get, getting a hare, etc., then a fine of two hundred and seventy-six quid uh, is is but a drop in the ocean. And I do wonder, as I often do in these circumstances, whether our local magistrates also feel intimidated, given the reputation that a lot of people involved with hair coursing have of actually seeing no bounds to the retribution which they wish to see. Now, I hope that our magistrates are made of strong and robust stuff, but that might not necessarily uh, always be the case. But in closing, and in congratulating uh, yet again uh, the work that the Dorset Constabulary and those officers do, I echo entirely the point made by my honourable friend that the funding requirements, as so often in our rural areas, is very bespoke. If you went and said to, I don't know, councillors in Manchester or, or, or Bristol or Birmingham or something, rural crime on farms as a result of hair coursing, they would probably scratch their heads and look very bemused. But this causes great loss of income, great degradation of the countryside, a vast amount of cruelty, a huge amount of illegality, and those niche issues that need to be policed with robustness, uh, with intelligence, and with coordination do need to find in our rural policing and its funding formula an identification of how best to marry funds with the very clear demands which my honourable friend has elucidated in what has been an excellent debate. Minister Brandon Lewis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, look, first of all, I would just want to thank my honourable friend, the member for Salisbury and South Wiltshire, for securing this debate, and indeed for all um, honourable members and friends for their contributions. And I think the scale of the contributions today, the number of people um, here in the chamber, outlines the importance of this issue for people across the country in rural communities. In essence, I won't be keeping the House um, too long on the basis of, in principle, I agree with what's been said. Um, but I think I will elucidate just a little bit further into the detail of what's behind that, because I do know that the issues raised are of concern, clearly from the comments made in the interventions and the speeches this evening so far, for rural communities. And I've heard these as well very much firsthand. So I just want to start by being very clear that I am absolutely aware that people, and I am very clear about the fact, that people should not have to experience the crimes described, nor should they ever feel under threat or victimised or harassed as witnesses or victims directly. Anything of this nature is wholly unacceptable, and I do expect the police to act. Now, as has been noted in this debate already, and as the House more widely will be aware, the Hunting Act of 2004 came into effect in 2005, 18th of February to be precise, and under that Act, if found guilty of illegal hunting or hair coursing, an individual can receive an unlimited fine. But I do note the comments, and I think coming to the second request of my honourable friend first, so to speak, um, the level of the fines being issued out through the magistrate's court. So I have noted his comments and I can give him the assurance that I will liaise with colleagues at the Ministry of Justice to look at what guidance there is for the magistrate's courts and through the Sentencing Council about how that power is being used. Because there is a point around sending a very clear message to the criminals who conduct this kind of behaviour, and they are abhorrent criminals who conduct this kind of behaviour, that that will not be tolerated. There is also Section 30 of the Game Act of 1831, as has rightly been outlined. And we have to remember that does give the police the power to seize and detain vehicles taking part in hair coursing until a court hearing. The police themselves also have the powers to deal with other criminal offences. And when I was visiting Lincolnshire recently, it was very clear to me when I was there at the invitation of my honourable friend, the member for 
um, Louth and Horncastle, there was some really clear evidence of the ability to look at all of the crimes being committed. As honourable friends have noted already this evening, hair coursing in and of itself is an offence. But in hair coursing, other offences are potentially committed. Aggravated trespass, abuse, intimidation, harassment, criminal damage, all of which are prosecutable in their own right. And it is also an opportunity, as one of my officials rightly pointed out when we were in Lincolnshire, that in some of these situations, for example, as has been outlined through CCTV and other means, even if the police are not able to catch somebody in the act of hair coursing, by the nature of the speed with which this moves, as has been outlined, I appreciate there can be a challenge with that. If there is a number plate, what we are often finding is that these are number plates for vehicles that are not taxed, not MOT'd and there is an action the police can take for that incident in itself without the need to necessarily involve catching somebody in the act or putting a farmer in a position where they um, have a reason to be in fear. And I think we need to be clear that the police can look at all of this range of options to be smart about how we look at prosecuting and cracking down on this kind of behaviour. Now, obviously, decisions about how resources are used and how law enforcement is run in individual areas is a matter for individual chief officers and indeed it is for those chief councils to determine how they deploy working in terms of the priorities in the policy terms for a local area with their police and crime commissioners and I do note the police and crime commissioner for Wiltshire's um, policing plan I think has been published today and there are areas where the police and crime commissioners like the police and crime commissioner Mark Jones in Lincolnshire do want to get a grip of this kind of issue and I commend them for doing that, for realising and appreciating that in representing their communities they're understanding what is important to their community and I think it highlights why devolving these powers into those locally accountable, local elected PCCs is such an important step. And I know co colleagues have already this evening noted the um, issue around funding and I will just remind the House that we are very clearly committed to reforming the current police funding arrangements. They are out of date and they need to be updated. We want to make sure that we have a system that is fairer, based on a fair system, is up to date and importantly is transparently able to reflect how crime is being dealt with locally. We are at the moment in a process of taking forward through this current period a detailed engagement with the sector itself, both police, chief constables, police and crime commissioners and experts and academics in the field. And I and myself have met with a whole range of police and crime commissioners and chief constables to look at and discuss with them the issues that they think should be covered. And a number of them, including representatives whose uh, colleagues and members have spoken this evening, have raised this issue of making sure that rural policing is reflected and the costs that it faces and the challenges that it faces are reflected in that formula. Now, no new formula obviously will be implemented without, any, without public consultation. There will be a full process, but it will be at the end of this substantial piece of work that we are doing to make sure it is fully, fully informed. And I have met with the PCC for Wiltshire, who has made this point about his own force very directly to me, as indeed has my honourable friend, the member who brought this debate. And I also appreciate that there are complaints, both from communities as well as members, the police are not always doing enough to deal with the criminals involved in this activity. And as I've said, we do need to be smart. We do need to drive through our police and crime commissioners and our local chief constables to make sure that local police are using all of the tools at their disposal to deal with criminal behaviour. And if they are deal facing an issue where there is a challenge about the speed with which people move, then actually looking at the other tools they've got, as I say, around trespass and the way they deal with cars. And as has rightly been noted, there is a very clear and powerful message in terms of seizure of vehicles, which is an expensive thing for people to have to deal with, and indeed, actually, the seizure of the dogs themselves. And I know from talking to the police in Lincolnshire, where they are looking to seize dogs, and they have organised for kennels, even having the kennels outside of Lincolnshire to make it even more difficult, that has a powerful message because these dogs, to the people who own them, are valuable, tens of thousands of pounds. And there's a very clear message that we and the police can bring. I do also just want to join my um, honourable friend um, whose debate this is today and my honourable friend, the member um, for Dorset, who spoke um, just a few moments ago, in joining them in congratulating both their forces in some of the excellent work they are looking to do to deal with some of the issues around rural crime, as well as the work that others, as I've said, like Lincolnshire, are looking to do to develop, to make sure they are representing the needs of their local communities. And I just want to be very clear, as I, as I said a few moments ago, 
the decisions on how people allocate their resources and what local police are focused on is a matter for them, with their police and crime commissioners, based on their local knowledge, to determine working with their chief constables. And if anybody has got an area where their police and ch chief constable or their police and crime commission is not focused on an issue such as this, I would encourage them to bring it to their attention, to make this point, and I will happily um, continue to work on that as well. And I will be meeting um, again, as I have done recently, with the police, the National Police Chief Council's lead on rural crime and on these issues to reinforce the strength of feeling as clearly has been outlined um, so eloquently by colleagues and honourable friends and members this evening. My honourable friend did outline three particular requests. I've dealt with his second um, request, but dealing with his first and third points, in terms of firstly updating the legislation procedures around seizure, I will look at the powers that the police have got. I do think they've got the powers that they need, and I think the question is around how these are being used and implemented, but I will undertake to do some further work, again, working with the National Police Chief Council's lead on this issue, and I will get back to my honourable friend on that and involve him and any other colleague who's interested in making sure they are up to speed with the work that we are doing and what the opportunities are. And his third point around the number of people actually being charged with these issues and the issue of looking at how farmers feel in terms of the intimidation potentially if they come forward as witnesses. And this is something we discussed recently when I was in Lincolnshire. And there is a real challenge there, and I want people to be able to feel they can come forward and work with the police, both formally and informally, and we'll continue to work to develop that. In closing, I would just like to again thank not just my honourable friend for securing this debate today, but for all honourable members who have taken the time to be here to contribute, to highlight the importance and the genuine importance of making sure we're able to police and protect our rural, rural communities properly. And I want to just take this opportunity to finally also commend and congratulate the police who do work hard to deal with this kind of issue, but to remind them we expect to see this dealt with, we expect to use, see them use the full set of tools at their disposal, and I'll support them in doing that as we move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Well